Animation allows total immersion into a manufactured world. Everything the viewer sees is conceived, it's deliberate. However, rather than presenting reality in a literal way, animation creates life through expression. Character and emotions are conveyed through exaggerated movements, and the possibility of what can be presented are limited only by the author's imagination, meaning anything can be seen, and anything can be felt. Hello and welcome to Animation Propaganda. In our last episode, we looked at the history of mass manipulation and information control. This video will be just a little lighter as we dive into the early days of American animation, specifically cartoons. We've actually covered a lot of ground in terms of early animation, so that should save us some time here. Uh, if you're interested in the roots of the medium, check out last year's History of Computer Animation. Uh, that took us from the Magic Lantern all the way to Windsor McKay. This is going to pick up right where we left off with McKay and run through the golden age of American animation. Uh, we will be, of course, venturing into the cartoon history of other cultures in future videos, uh, but this is going to focus exclusively on America's output and why it lends itself so well to propaganda. Cartoons as we have come to know them grew to newspaper comic strips, where many pioneers of American animation got their start, including Windsor McKay. McKay produced his films similar to multi-panel comics by drawing and filming every movement on an individual piece of paper. These experiments were often financed by his boss, a newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst. Hearst newspapers were instrumental in the widespread acceptance of yellow journalism, or what we today call fake news. The stories he ran were often exaggerated or straight-up fiction, with a focus on the sensational. In 1915, Hearst founded the International Film Service, or IFS, an animation studio. Hearst hoped he could capitalize on the popularity of his strips by bringing them to life through the exciting new medium of animation. IFS, however, was not the first animation studio. Raoul Bray began his career producing cartoons for Edison Studios. In 1914, he would establish his own, dedicated completely to animation. While no iconic star emerged from Bray, the studio is notable for the introduction of the peg system, which allowed animators to keep each frame in line, as well as the less enduring slash system. The slash system was a way of minimizing an animator's work by allowing the reuse of parts of the frame. A frame could be drawn, photographed, and then part of it torn away and replaced by the succeeding action, creating an animated scene. Many animators that would contribute to the medium's evolution got their startup array, including Pat Sullivan, who we'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, however, as he was wont to do with newspapers, William Randolph first poached Bray's staff, with Bray himself briefly acting as a consultant for the IFS. The same year Bray opened his studio, John Randolph Bray founded Bray Studios. Rather than employing established cartoonists to adapt existing properties, Bray brought on new talent to create original series, the first of which was his own Colonel He's a Liar, an adventure loosely based on Teddy Roosevelt. Along with Earl Hurd, Bray would develop the next major innovation in animation, the cell process. Animators could now save time and effort by drawing the action on transparent sheets and photographing them over static illustrated backgrounds, thus replacing Bray's slash method as industry standard. Streamlining the process also helped Bray Productions establish themselves as the country's top animation studio. Bray would go on to employ and foster the talents of Paul Terry, Walter Lance, and David Max Fleischer. As we covered in the last episode, in 1917, America's Committee on Public Information crafted a massive, anti-German campaign aimed at swaying public opinion towards war. William Randolph Hearst, who believed a majority of his readers were of German descent, maintained a sympathetic position with Germany. Because of this, and the CPI's success, Hearst's reputation suffered, and with it his business. IFS folded in 1919, and his animated properties were licensed to Bray. Cartoons were used to book at newsreels prior to film screenings. They were not marquee attractions. That changed in 1919 with the emergence of Felix the Cat. Debuting as Master Tom in Feline Follies, Felix quickly captured the nation's attention, breaking out of the medium and into the mainstream. Felix was treated like a movie star, and was merchandised to no end. He spawned a slew of imitators, and the mixture of a lovable, anthropomorphic animal in surreal situations wrote the template for pretty much everything that followed. Felix also has the distinction of being one of the first images transmitted by television, when a doll bearing his likeness was broadcast as a test pattern during an experiment in 1928. Now, there is some dispute as to who created Felix. The studio, owned by former Bray animator Pat Sullivan, claimed ownership. It was common practice that studios retained rights to anything created by their staff, who went largely uncredited. Sullivan's lead animator, Otto Mesmer, claimed to have conceived and drawn feline follies himself, though. Sullivan's career was marred by incompetence, not to mention racism, alcoholism, and pedophilia, and a majority of historians and peers back Mesmer's claims. Regardless, Felix was a product of his time. He captured the spirit of the jazz age and reflected the events of the day. However, he would fall out of fashion when film and cartoons made the move to synchronize sound. He continued to be marketed throughout the 20th century, though never again reached the heights he had in the 1920s. 
In 1921, illustrator Walt Disney and his partner of iWorks were contracted by a Kansas City theater to create a series of newsreel cartoons. Inspired by Paul Terry's Aesop's fables, the resulting laughograms were takes on popular fairy tales, featuring Felix clone Julius the Cat. Julius would appear in Disney's next series, the Fleischer-inspired Alice Comedies. This series, which combined live action with animation, was loosely based on Lewis Carroll's novels, and followed the adventures of Julius and Alice as they navigated an animated Wonderland. It was born out of the final laughogram, Alice's Wonderland, during production of which Disney Studio filed for bankruptcy. He would contact distributor Margaret J. Winkler in hopes of getting the film seen. Winkler had been instrumental in the growth of the industry, having distributed Fleischer's out of the Inkwell series as well as Felix the Cat. Disney's timing was perfect, as she was losing the rights to both when he sent her Alice's Wonderland. Moving to Hollywood, Disney formed a new studio with his brother Roy, with iWorks in tow. Disney Brothers, which would eventually grow into the Walt Disney Company, was born. Winkler married her employee, Charles Mintz, in 1924, who would assume control over Disney's distribution. The combination of cost and waning interest led to Disney abandoning Alice in favor of total animation. With the popularity of cartoons, film studio Universal Pictures sought a character of their own. Mintz encouraged Disney and company to come up with something they could pitch. The result was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. With Oswald, Disney ushered in a new era of character-driven animation. Building upon Felix, Oswald introduced a level of expressiveness in which personality is informed by movement. Oswald was Disney's first hit, and his popularity allowed the studio to grow. However, despite creating it with iWorks, they did not own the rights to the character. Universal did. After being denied a larger cut of the profits, Disney would step away from Oswald, and Charles Mintz continued producing shorts, with a staff comprised of animators he hired away from Disney. iWorks stuck with Disney, and the pair set out to create their own character they would have complete control over. In 1928, they produced two shorts featuring a mice couple, but could not find distribution. Inspired by the jazz singer, Disney decided a synchronized soundtrack would make his new cartoon more appealing and attract a distributor. The sound had been used before in cartoons, but failed to make much of an impression. It was very much a novelty. This gamble paid off, and the first released Mickey Mouse cartoon, Steamboat Willie, became a resounding success, and launched a media empire that today owns nearly $100 billion in creative assets, and is responsible for over a quarter of the film industry's total output. What followed has become known as the golden age of American animation. As he had done with sound, Disney popularized the use of color in cartoons with 1932's Flowers and Trees. While not the first, he would again further the medium with 1937's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, a feature-length cartoon. This asserted Disney's dominance as the country's top animation studio. During this time, many of Disney's contemporaries also established their own iconic characters. In 1930, his early rivals the Fleischers debuted Betty Boop. Like Felix, Betty Boop embodied the spirit of the Jazz Age and the post-depression world. She stumbled through surreal situations and maintained an independence few female cartoons were allowed. She was her own character, who embraced her sexuality, at least until the passing of the Hayes Code in 1934. In addition to Betty, the Fleischers produced an adaptation of the comic strip Popeye that would become the most popular property, eclipsing, briefly, even Mickey Mouse in terms of star power. The series followed the spinach-fueled adventures of Popeye the Sailor, who was more often than not pitted against his rival, Bluto, for the affection of olive oil. Both Popeye and Betty Boop reflected the gritty realities of Depression-era America, contrasting Disney's whimsical disposition. While these characters enjoy their time in the limelight, they have since largely fallen from the public consciousness. Next to Disney, no studio has been able to maintain relevance quite as much as Warner Brothers. Prior to founding their in-house studio in 1933, Leon Schlesinger produced cartoons for Warner with former Disney animators Hugh Harmon and Rudy Ising. The early shorts featured Harmon and Ising's Bosco. Conceived while the two were still working for Disney, Bosco was one of the better depictions of African Americans in cartoons. Better, but still not great. After a falling out over money, Harmon and Ising left Schlesinger, taking Bosco with them. It wouldn't be until 1935 that animator Frizz Freeling gave Warner their first true star in Porky Pig. Porky premiered alongside several others in Freeling's I Haven't Got a Hat. While Bosco and his short-lived replacement buddy had uttered the phrase, it was Porky who immortalized the classic send-off. Warner cartoons were known for their zaniness, and Porky was the perfect straight man to play off of. In what is perhaps his most famous cartoon, Porky visits Wacky Land, a hallucinatory dreamscape created by Bob Clampett. While popular, Porky would eventually be eclipsed by Daffy Duck, who made his debut in Tex Avery's Porky's Duck Hunt. Daffy would in turn be eclipsed by a bunny that would become Warner's signature mascot and rival Mickey Mouse for the title of Top Cartoon. Bugs Bunny was formally introduced to the world in 1940's A Wild Hare. He starred in several iconic shorts, but in the hands of Chuck Jones, Bugs reached the pinnacle of his career, and maybe even the medium in 1957. What's Opera Doc lampoons the music of German composer Richard Wagner, with Bugs and Elmer Fudd assuming the roles of Broomhilda and Siegfried. 
The two follow their usual routine of Elmer hunting bugs through stylized set pieces and parody. Working with just six minutes, Jones manages to encapsulate Wagner's work as well as stage a ballet, with plenty of time left over for gags and what has repeatedly been ranked as the greatest cartoon of all time. The advent of television effectively rendered theatrical animation obsolete. However, many shorts found a second life in early children's programming before fading away in favor of new, original characters. So why do cartoons make effective propaganda? The most obvious answer is the perception that they are geared towards children. Uh, indoctrination, you know, get them while they're young. However, like cartoons, not all propaganda is aimed at kids. No, I believe cartoons are effective propaganda because they are both distorted and conceived realities. Each gives its creator the ability to manufacture and present their vision of the world. Where propaganda manipulates facts, cartoons are able to express them in a way that's exaggerated or absurd. Together, they can bring a soldier to a battlefield and show them the enemy they want them to see. Or, they can anthropomorphize and portray them with the characteristics of animals, literally less than human. Certain characters have broken through to our world. Look at the star power of Felix, in his time, or Bugs or Mickey. But still, there is a disconnect between them and reality. This disconnect is a valuable tool for propagandists. The delivery of the message is softened when it comes from the mouth of a bunny, rather than someone who looks like you or your neighbor. With cartoons, propagandists are given complete control over how their message is conveyed by using and manipulating characters with which you have already developed a bond, perhaps even a sentimental one. In our next video, we will look at how this partnership has been used in America's war on drugs. Like propaganda, this subject is huge, and this was not meant to be an exhaustive history. Uh, I'm sure I missed out on some things, so feel free to comment or even correct down below. Uh, we will also be exploring this more in a process video over on Patreon, patreon.com slash pixandportraits. You can support us there. I will post links to relevant material in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and be sure to check out part one. Uh, as always, thank you so much for your interest in this channel, and thank you so much for watching.